When you think of post-conflict reconstruction, yoga might not be the very first thing that comes to mind. Well, after today, all that may change. Project AIR started two years ago as an experiment in Rwanda, but it's going strong and it's got great plans. Deirdre Summerbell is the founder and director of Project AIR, and she's here to tell us more. Welcome to Grit TV, Deirdre. It's great to have you. Thank you very much. I mean, it is true. When you think of a war-torn nation and a population who are hugely to a huge extent victims of rape and assault, you don't necessarily think yoga is going to solve it. Not immediately. <laughs> it's a bit of an oxymoron. How did it get started then? What, how did you begin this project? Uh, I was contacted by a medical NGO that works in Rwanda. And its uh, it remit is the genocidal rape victims themselves and they're usually their HIV, their HIV positive children who were born of the rapes. Mm. And they're one of the few uh, NGOs there that provide mental health services. Mm. And they've, men they've medically stabilized their, the community that they work with, um, with a ARVs and so on. But trauma remains a, an abiding problem. So these were people who were originally reaching out to you and yoga as a sort of complement to their, their mental health work. Exactly. And how did they see it getting where talk therapy and stuff couldn't go? Well, talk therapy, drugs, and so on in that environment are difficult things to use with any sort of efficacy because they really they require sort of a continuous application. And so the, the doctors of this NGO thought, well, let's, let's, try, let's set about looking for alternatives. Mm. Somebody brought up the idea of yoga and eyebrows went up and <laughs> eyes rolled. <laughs> but somehow the idea persisted, and, and so I was contacted, and I was asked whether I would be willing to do a, conduct this experiment. And you thought? Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was a stupid idea. And then what happened? Well, not stupid, let me say that. I mean, it was skeptical. Uh -huh. um, and, and, I, but, and I said no immediately, and then I went and I went off and thought about it for a couple of weeks, and then I, I went back and I began to, I rang them back and I said, well, let's discuss this. Um, and eventually, because I grew up myself in Tanzania, I was sort of curious to get back, curious to see whether this would work. So I took a deep breath and I, and I gave it a try. So mm. signs went up somewhere in Kigali. We're going to be giving yoga classes. Come. No, no, no. That was no, no. <laughs> the um, the NGO works has several clinics. It has a. It probably it has a remit. It probably has. It reaches about four thousand, five thousand women and children, and so we began working with the children and the women that it works with. Um, Did you find the Rwandans reluctant to come to participate? Were they skeptical as you were? On the contrary, there's. Yoga in Rwanda, at least for the women that we work with and the children, is sort of a conceptual void. It doesn't exist as an idea, so they couldn't, there was no anticipatory skepticism. We just turned up in their midst and we began asking them. We, actually, we did demonstrations, mm. um, and they were horrified. <laughs> they were absolutely horrified. Women turning upside down, standing on their heads. Well, yes, and, and so the first thing they did, um, and by the way, the average, the ages, they were sort of 28 till about 48. Yeah. The 28 and 29 year olds were the first ones to say that they were too old. Mm. They were too sick for this. This was for children. And they all very politely said no. Um, within half an hour, they were in the middle of the room. Mm. And they were, I mean, they, they absolutely threw themselves into it and they just adored it. Now this, we've been kidding a bit, but I was in Rwanda and, and the people that you meet there, and it's women who are the majority of the population, the majority of the survivors, they haven't just, they don't just bear psychological scars. Many of them bear deep wounds, certainly psychologically, but physically. Their bodies were, to use the cliche, truly a battlefield. The idea of their opponents, of their enemies, was to erase them as people to dehumanize them, but leave them alive exactly. as the witnesses. How do you bring, as a teacher, how do you bring somebody back into a more friendly relationship with their body? Well, we give them, we allow them, we give them the time and we allow them the opportunity, we give them the opportunity to re-engage with it. For the women that we work with, for the children that we work with, this time is unheard of. 
In the West, we take it for granted that you can take an hour or two. You usually fight the opportunity to mm -hmm. do so, mm -hmm. but you can take an hour or two for yourself. You can go to the gym, you can whatever it is that you do. For these women who are acculturated to be the donkeys of their, of their, of their cultures, um, they're the workhorses, mm -hmm. this opportunity is, uh, it doesn't exist. And so here we are, we're offering it to them we're taking them through a very fixed sort of um, a very fixed sort of routine, and we're allowing them to re-experience what it's like, and to re-enjoy again what it's like to be alive. Um, so they think of themselves as old. They are depressed. Many of them have PSTD, or they're clinic you know they're clinically depressed, or clinically traumatized, um, and they've given up at some level, fundamental mm -hmm. level, and it's the level that's I mean, they live this emptiness. So what we do is, with the yoga, we sort of meet them at that level, which makes it as effective as it actually is. Because we get, they, by taking our classes, they begin to feel again how exciting it is to be, a, you know, that physical, that visceral sense of what it's like to be alive. But still, to trust your body and to appreciate your body's strength, when it's been such a site of pain and, in many cases, bears the scars of an enemy's machete. Mm. Um, talk about that process. It's a fair question. I think the experience of women in Rwanda, and I'm, I'm hoping those, it will be the same experience of those in Congo, um, their experience of this trauma, while certainly real and, 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 and significant, is not the same as a Western woman's mm. experience might be. They're not, they haven't reified their bodies to the degree that we do. We mm. sort of make a distinction as if the, you know, the body were some sort of separate territory which we might be alienated from or we might be returned to in some form or another. These women don't do that. They inhabit themselves, as we all should, um, but they, they do so with a tremendous amount of sorrow and in some cases um, they have compromised autonomic nervous systems because they have been clin clinically traumatized. So that it's not that that they have they're alienated from themselves as much as they have simply forgotten in the depressions what it what it is to that visceral sensation we all have which which is um, which is the pleasure of being alive. Mm. You say in your materials, and we should say that this has gone from an experiment to a project that you're seeking funding for right now to exactly. continue and bring to Congo. You say in your materials that there's also a preventative part that yoga can play to help prevent abuse? How? Uh, this is a sort of a personal, this is a personal um, um, project of my own. Um, we work with traumatized women, but we also work with their children. We have in Kigali, we have 400 HIV positive orphans that we work with every weekend. A lot of them are prepubescent or adolescent girls. Um, I noticed when I first got there that it was an axiom that the girls at between the ages of 9, 10, or 11 would be handed, handed over to sexual abuse support groups because they were being abused mm. already. And I thought, well, what a bloody waste, excuse me, but what a waste of resources. I mean, of course, help them afterwards, but why not do something to prevent this? So we make, we have a special, we make a special effort to work with teenage girls or prepubescent girls, and we, the, the yoga that we teach it makes them very strong. It, um, these girls have been sexualized too young. Um, they, in uh, HIV, their HIV status in that culture makes, um, makes them, it's not a full social ostracism, but damn close. Um, so we make them proud to be themselves. We, we teach them to value their strengths. Mm. So they arrive sort of with glittery tops <laughs> and they don't want to talk to us. <laughs> and then they leave, um, they leave you know, sort of doing this. And we have, um, we have a, a special group called the Inyangi, Inyangi Girls, which is named after a very highly symbolic bird in Rwanda. And it, it seems to be working out. It's no guarantee. Sure. But if we make them, we create a community spirit amongst them. We make them stronger. We make them value themselves. Do you think there's a role, do you think there's an impact on the boys that's different from the girls, boys that have been, many of them, um, in the past anyway, targeted by, by 
militia groups to be the perpetrators next time around? Well, we work uh, obviously with the, the boy children of the, of the women um, that we serve as well, and we make a big point of teaching, as a, stressing the values of tolerance and kindness. And, and um, you know, we're only two years, we've, this is only two years in duration. Yoga is slow medicine. I mean, it's sort of, but it is, it has, figuratively, it is medicinal in character, and I think given the opportunity, we will see changes in values. Um, and your future plan, and how can people help? Well, they can, they can, future plan is to expand. We want to get into Congo, Eastern Congo, specifically where our remit is to help the most vulnerable girls and women in the world. And there are no more vulnerable girls and women than in Eastern Congo at the moment because of the conflict there. Yeah. Um, we want, we will be, we're hoping to work with two, uh, only two um, hospitals in the area that do fistula operations. Um, then we want to go possibly into Burundi, and it's been suggested that we go into Gaza mm. and to Afghanistan. And how can people help if they want to participate? We have a website, project-air.org, and we're actually at the moment doing a, a massive fundraiser in order to be able to afford to travel and, and expand. All right, Deidre, thanks so much for, for coming in. Thank project you. Air, there's more information at our website. Check it out.